See, when it comes to false teachers and false teaching, we are never commanded in the Bible to bury our head in the sand or to keep silent or just to go along with things. Not at all. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Also, let's just be practical for a second. Do you really think you're gonna be able to, you know, get out Stephen Furtick's cell phone number, you know, 555-H-E-L-L. Well, welcome to Real Talk with Jordan Riley, where the real talk does not come from me. It comes directly from God's word. And before we get started today, please consider subscribing to our channel, giving this a thumbs up, and supporting what we do by going to realtalkwithjordan.com. On today's episode, false teachers are everywhere, yet most of us do not know what to do with them or how to handle them. So today, we're going to answer the million dollar question, how should we confront a false teacher? Now, trust me, this is going to be a powerful episode. And yes, I'm going to show you examples of false teaching and what to do with it. So are you ready? Let's go. And Jesus will look at them and he said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. This man is a worker of iniquity. Which man? You. He preaches a well, God bless you. This is a true promise, though. This is a true... Don't get me with your crutch. Well, I'm just trying to bless you. Well, thank you, sir. I'm not giving you my anointing because I have nothing to give. Thank you. Just bless him and just pray and hallelujah. So anyways, if you would like the text 67076 and just send a message, get ignited. You can be on that list. We just bless our friend tonight. Wow. Did you see what happened right there? That man lovingly and boldly confronted false teacher Todd Bentley. And he confronted him with the truth of God's word in front of everyone. <laughs> now that's what I'm talking about. But I bet many of you are wondering, do we have to confront false teachers like that every time? Or you're wondering, do we need to make big signs and stand outside of their crusades and, you know, kind of, you know, false teacher, don't do this, false teacher, stay away? Or do we need to call and email them and set up a one-on-one -on -one appointment where we lovingly confront them? Hang on, I'll transfer your call. No, no, and definitely not. So how should we confront a false teacher? This episode is going to deal with just that. And you're going to see why it's important and how it's done. Because there's a lot of misconceptions around this subject. So let's start with an example of false teaching. Let me think here. Who should we use? Hmm. Let's use Stephen Furtick. Watch this. This is where I get to coach you. This is where I get to be a voice in your life that reminds you that you are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. The voice in your life that helps you realize that you are more than the math of what is against you, that you are more than the mistakes that you have made, that the great I am lives in you, and whatever he is, you are too. Woo! I feel a flow coming. What on earth did he just say? Did you hear that? The only thing flowing from Stephen Furtick's mouth is pure heresy. So you heard the false teaching right there, and you realize that this man is leading people astray. So what do we do about it? Hmm, let's think about that a second. Now, sadly, many of you will cite Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. Well, you need to go to him. You need to have a little convo one-on-one, -on -one. have a little chat, tell him where he's wrong. You know, see if you can pray with him. Wrong. That is not what that Bible verse is talking about at all. If you look at Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, it is talking about church discipline. And it's about going to a brother or sister in Christ, by the way, who is in sin. And there's a three-step process that Jesus commands us to do. So you go personally one-on-one. -on -one. If, if they repent, you stop there, you're good. If they do not repent, you bring in a couple of witnesses, two or three. If they do not repent, you go on to the third step, which is you bring them before the church, the church that you and they are a part of. 
So unless you go to Elevation Church out of North Carolina, which is a whole nother ball of wax and a whole big problem, you can't bring Stephen Furtick before your church which means Matthew 18 verses 15 through 20 does not apply in confronting false teachers. Also, let's just be practical for a second. Do you really think you're gonna be able to, you know, get out Stephen Furtick's cell phone number, you know, 555-H-E-L-L. Oh, you know, just call him up. Hey, Stephen, yeah, this is Jordan. Just wanted to go get some coffee with you. Let's go to McDonald's and get a little, uh, you know, McFlurry. No, come on, you guys, that is not going to happen. So no, going to a false teacher one-on-one -on -one is not what Matthew 18 verses 15 through 20 is talking about. Also, if you look through all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus did not go to the false teachers, you know, pull them aside one-on-one -on -one and personally confront them face to face. No, he didn't. So what did he do? Well, I'm going to tell you that in just a second, but let's continue. Don't let anybody put anything on you that will cause you to forget what God put in you. The fight that you have to win for your life has not been with them. It's always been in you. Because if you believe it's in you, there's nothing anybody can put on you that can cancel what I put in you. Before you were born, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. It's always been in you. And there's nobody that can leave my life that can keep God from keeping his covenant with me. I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Now you heard how unbiblical that was. And many of you are already getting ready to start quoting Matthew 7, 1. Judge not lest ye be judged. Don't you judge. Don't be a little judgmental person. Only God can judge somebody. Come on, you guys. This is not some magical formula to fix the situation. Let's just be quiet, not say anything. Not at all. You cannot take one single verse, rip it out of context, and make it your theology. See, the entire context of this judging part is Matthew 7, verses 1 through 6. In those verses, Jesus is not condemning all judging. Not at all. He's actually teaching us how to do the judging. And he's also making sure that we don't judge superficially and hypocritically. See, we need to make sure that we take the whole counsel of God into consideration. Let me give you an example. In John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus absolutely commands us to judge with righteous judgment. In 1 Corinthians 5, verses 12 to 13, Paul says that we are to judge people inside the church. In 1 Peter 4, verse 17, Peter says that judgment begins in the house of God. And in 1 John 4, 1, John says that we are to test all things. So when we do what the Bible commands us to do, we can see that Stephen Furtick or Todd Bentley or Bill Johnson or Benny Hinn or Joyce Meyer or Paula White, they are unbiblical and they go against God's word, which makes them, come on, say it with me, false teachers. Now, just so we're clear, many in the church today, when it comes to naming names, exposing false teachers, calling out false teachers, they'll say, well, you're not being nice. That's not nice. Like it's some 11th commandment in the Bible. Thou shalt be nice. Now knock it off. <laughs> Come on, you guys. How is this even true? If you lived on a street where there was a bunch of houses, and let's say that two houses down, someone moved in that you found out was convicted of rape. <gasps> Would you just not say anything and not tell anybody because you wanted to be nice? Of course you wouldn't. Come on, man. You would absolutely go to your neighbor and warn them of the potential danger and the, th the threat that is living in their neighborhood. And that's what Paul was talking about in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. He says not to partner with evil, but rather to expose them. And exposing talks about bringing it to light, sounding the alarm, and warning. Sadly, Satan has convinced too many people that we need to just turn a blind eye, you know, and uh, keep quiet. 
as he deceives people with false teachers who do his bidding. And I say to that, said no verse ever. We are commanded to speak up. Romans 16 verses 17 and 18. We are to mark false teachers. The word in Greek is scopio, means to scope out, to get them in your sights, to make sure you know who they are. And then once you scope them out, you are to warn, you are to sound the alarm. Now, how did Jesus handle all this? Did he just be quiet and leave it into God's hands? No. Or did he go quietly in the night and privately have a little one-on-one -on -one confrontation with a Pharisee, just, you know, kind of face-to-face -face with no one watching? See, the Bible gives plenty of examples of how Jesus handled and confronted false teachers. First, let's look at Luke chapter 20, verses 45 through 47. It says this, And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Did you see right there in the text, in Luke 20, verse 45, he did it right in front of everyone, for everyone to hear. Another great example, one of my favorites, is Matthew 23, verses 13 through 33. In this section of scripture, Jesus pronounce seven woes, that's a divine judgment, by the way, against false teachers of the day. But how did he do it? You need to hear this. Well, let's look at Matthew 23, verses one and two at the beginning of the chapter. It says, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Right there in the text, that's the second example you see. Jesus spoke to the crowds in public. And just a few verses later, in verses 13 through 33, he called out the scribes and the Pharisees. And very harshly, by the way, he called them sons of hell, brood of vipers, and whitewashed tombs. <laughs> Ouch! That's gotta hurt! Jesus did not go privately to them and have a little one-on-one -on -one confrontation. Not at all. So why did he do it this way? I believe the answer is in 1 Timothy chapter 5, Verse 20, it says, Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. See, we expose false teachers. We call them out in public as a warning for those who are listening and following them and under their deception. See, if we care about people, we will speak up and we will sound the alarm. See, when it comes to false teachers and false teaching, we are never commanded in the Bible to bury our head in the sand or to keep silent or just to go along with things. Not at all. We are commanded to warn people and to speak up. Also, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26, we call out false teachers in love, by the way, with the hope that God will open their eyes to the truth and that God will lead them to repentance. So when it comes to confronting a false teacher, you absolutely can handle it like this man. We need to show an intense love to them. But above all of those things, we need to spend all of our time at the deepest place of prayer, praying that God indeed would protect all those who hear this false message that comes from our lips. Because God's message is not miracles, but that the shed blood of Jesus Christ would cleanse humble sinners. And when miracles are emphasized, Jesus is denied. Now, when it comes to confronting false teachers, I think you have three options. Now, the first one, like you saw in that last clip, I mean, hey, it might get you escorted off the property, but by all means, it's not a bad option. And go ahead, go for it. Or as a second option, you can sound the alarm in person or online like we do here on Real Talk. Please though, make sure you do it in love. And as you expose the false teacher or the false doctrine, you also teach what the truth of God's word actually says. Or there's a third option. You can just ignore it and pretend it's no big deal and hope it goes away. <laughs> oh boy. 
<laughs> Come on. The point is that we must be people of action who don't just sit around and do nothing. Jesus and the apostles constantly warned people of false teachers and they constantly confronted false teachers. So will you be like the world and just go with the flow? I mean, that sounds great. Or will you be like Jesus and lovingly confront false teachers because souls are at stake and none of us are promised tomorrow?